I'm Joe and this is Joe and Tell. One of my most popular videos to date was my review of Bose speakers. And so this is a follow up video. Today I'm gonna to be taking a look at the Bose Acoustamass system, also known as the AM5 for short. In the 90s, these were some of the best selling speaker systems. I've read that this model in particular held 30% of the market just by itself. At the time, Bose was the product to have. If you weren't around at that time, it's kind of like how everybody wanted Beats headphones and Apple products. I've been testing these extensively and I can say that these do not suck. But at $800 original MSRP, they're probably just a little bit overpriced, but I bought them used for hundred bucks. Now when people say no highs, no lows, must be Bose, they're probably referring to these AM5s, but we'll take a look later on and see why that's not necessarily true. These do have some highs and we'll get into that in a bit. A bit of history about Bose, it was founded by Amar Bose, who was a professor at MIT. A lot of the Bose employees were MIT graduates. They were legitimate engineers with knowledge of psychoacoustics. Most people know Bose for their marketing savvy and for suing publications that were critical of their products, but they also made some pretty interesting designs. They used engineering principles and knowledge of psychoacoustics to get away with using less expensive components. I would even argue that they made products that pushed the boundaries of acoustics. This AM5, for example, is just that. I can't look at these and not think that they're possibly the precursor to the modern soundbar. So let's talk about what these are exactly. These are a lifestyle speaker. And when audiophiles typically talk about lifestyle products, there's a negative connotation that sound quality had to be sacrificed in order to make it more appealing to the average consumer. Considering that lifestyle is an actual line of Bose products, I think that's exactly what Bose was going for. These tiny speakers are meant to be as unobtrusive as possible. They call these jewel cubes and you can hold these jewels in the palm of your hand. Stop. They're meant to be used with a Bose base module, which can hardly be considered a subwoofer. We'll look at the measurements of that later. The base module is also small, about the size of a typical bookshelf speaker. The module is the key to the impression of big sound in a small package because it was meant to be hidden away in a corner where it didn't need to be seen. This is what people are referring to when they talk about a subwoofer satellite setup. Now, I previously thought that the Acoustamass system was proprietary, meaning you have to use only Bose products, but actually this is a totally passive system, meaning you can use it with any integrated amplifier or AVR. The crossovers are built into the base module. As far as aesthetics and build quality, I think these actually look pretty cool. These have been used and abused, but I like the small design elements with the rounded corners and logo. The feel of the plastic is decent and you can tell they spent money there, possibly sacrificing some of the quality on the internal components. I even like the design of the push terminals on the cubes. After listening for several days in various environments, I can understand why people love their Bose products. I remember when I was a kid, they made a dedicated theater at my local Fry's Electronics store. They did this demo where they had these two huge speakers on the wall Everybody was impressed with the sound and then these two guys came running up revealing that in fact, they weren't listening to the big speakers. They were actually the small Bose cubes behind them. I think everybody was shocked. After reviewing so many speakers now, I look back and wonder if I was crazy for being impressed. Maybe I just didn't know any better, but now that I've heard these in my home theater, I get it. Straight up, these sound better than some of the modern sound bars that I've listened to recently. Now let's take a look at the individual components, starting with the cubes. I think part of the reason people are impressed with this system is because it's possible to spread the speakers out far enough. The problem with most sound bars is the speakers are just too close horizontally to provide a good stereo sound stage. I tested these directly, as well as having them connected to the base module with its passive crossovers. On their own, without being connected to the base module, the cubes produce frequencies between 300 hertz to 20 kilohertz. With no crossover, they naturally rolled off at 18 decibels per octave. They had a rising treble response above two kilohertz, which I believe was done intentionally to sound impressive on the showroom floor, but also because of the naturally low sensitivity of these tiny speakers. In order for them to sound somewhat loud, they needed to boost the treble. Since it is a single full range driver without a dedicated tweeter, the high frequencies do fall off sooner than I would want. That's what people mean when they say no highs. I would argue though that with a treble boost, there are some highs, just not the highest frequencies. Connected to the base module, the cubes have the added benefit of a first order crossover, which adds another six decibels per octave to the high pass crossover. Combined with a natural roll off, you get a high pass 24 decibels per octave slope. You also get a slightly flattened response in the one kilohertz to seven kilohertz range, but the treble rise is still present. The crossover region is also slightly flatter. The directivity index is impressive, which you would expect from a single point source driver in a small enclosure. This graph is showing that the sound directly in front of it is similar to the sound to the sides and any differences are predictable and smooth. This means that it is possible to EQ the sound to lower the treble, but you will hit the max SPL limit sooner and you won't be able to play the system as loud. 
they also sold versions with two stacked cubes. The idea is that you could point one at you and one towards the wall and it would give you a wider sound stage. Since the sound would be similar to the direct sound, I can see why it might be a pleasing effect. I don't have the version with the stacked cubes, but I tried it and it helps by adding more output capability, especially where it's needed near the crossover region. You can wall mount these using the non-standard threads, but I did see comb filter and cancellation effects between 500Hz and 1kHz, but you do get slightly more bass boost around the 300Hz crossover region. Give and take. Now let's take a look at the base module. This component is extremely fascinating to me. I remember seeing a plexiglass version of these in a store demo and you could see all the internal components. I couldn't find a video, but basically they had small styrofoam balls inside of the plexiglass case and they'd play test tones, various low frequencies, and you would see the styrofoam balls creating these waves based on the frequency. That's just awesome marketing. Show, don't tell. It's important to note that these are using dual five and a quarter inch drivers for perspective that's the size that you'd get on small bookshelf speakers. On a more technical level, these are using an eighth order bandpass design, which is not something you see every day. You may have seen car audio systems where you can see the subwoofers in a plexiglass sealed enclosure, but the back of the woofer is in a ported enclosure. Most of those are fourth order bandpass designs. Bandpass enclosures are typically used because they reduce the higher frequencies above their tuning frequency. How that can be useful is it can hide distortion. The higher the order, the steeper the slope of the high frequency reduction. What that means in a practical sense is the higher order ones let less high frequencies through. A fourth order has a sealed section and the ported section like we talked about earlier. A sixth order has two ported sections. And look at how crazy this eighth order bandpass looks. The two woofers are in this inner sixth order bandpass enclosure where the front and back enclosures have tuned ports. Instead of firing out into the open air, it fires into yet another chamber with its own tuned port. That's what makes it an eighth order bandpass. The result of all this is that the crossover slope is steep at 48 decibels per octave at 205 Hertz, which saves them from having to use expensive passive crossover components to give them that slope. It also does a good job of hiding any distortion you may hear. If you were to say use five and a quarter inch woofers for bass duty, taking a look at the measurements, I was surprised at how flat the response was from 46 Hertz to 212 Hertz. It is within plus or minus three decibels. I measured the F10 at 37 Hertz, which is a useful measurement in determining the lowest bass you'll hear when placed in a room. The low frequency roll off is around 50 Hertz at 24 decibels per octave. You do hear some modulation around 20 Hertz, but there's no authority in that bass region. Perhaps it could give you a perception of bass extension, although it's truly not there. So when people say no lows, they may be referring to the lack of bass below 46 Hertz. Like with any other subwoofer satellite system, the integration of the subwoofer and the satellite speakers is crucial to a cohesive sound. Ideally, you'd want perfect integration, which would lead to a flat response from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz, the range of human hearing. That's not what we get here. People usually recommend an 80 Hertz crossover because that's a frequency range where bass is considered to be non-localizable. This is getting a bit technical, I know, but usually they combine that with a 24 decibels per octave slope on both ends, so there's perfect summation. In other words, that combination usually leads to the best blend of the subwoofer and the satellite speakers. But this system breaks all the rules by having a much higher crossover point between 200 Hertz and 300 Hertz, and with mismatched crossover slopes of 24 decibels per octave for the cubes and 48 decibels per octave for the base module. In software, I simulated the response and it led to a huge dip in the crossover region. I then measured it and the response confirms this with a 20 decibel dip centered around 230 Hertz. To be fair, psychoacoustically, we would hear something more like a six decibel dip, but it's definitely not ideal. Fortunately, having the base module near a wall adds about six decibels below 200 Hertz and having it near a corner adds up to nine decibels of boost. In addition to giving it a much needed boost in the lower frequencies, you also get a boost in the 200 to 300 Hertz range, which helps to further fill the gap in the crossover region. After seeing this, I was fully expecting the system to sound like two tiny speakers and a not so sub subwoofer. Instead, what I heard in my 20 by 20 by nine foot space was a semi convincing representation of a system that was much larger than the component suggested. I also tried it at my wife's desk and it was less impressive, possibly because the sub wasn't corner loaded and having the cubes close and reflecting off the desk further accentuated the treble boost. So here's a quick sound demo in my theater space. Meditate. 
So to summarize everything I learned from this experience, the phrase should be, no mids, some highs, some lows, must be bows. Now would a pair of decent bookshelf speakers outperform these? Yeah, for sure. But do keep in mind that that would be equivalent to having two of these Bose base modules somewhere in plain sight. That's just a no-go for most people. These are for people who don't wanna see any speakers, but also don't wanna do in-wall speakers. Honestly, I was fully expecting the system to suck, and I thought I would be spending most of my time explaining the system's weaknesses. I was happy to see that it does have redeeming qualities, and it's a reminder that for many people, good is good enough. What the Bose engineers were able to do considering the size and the cost of the components is pretty amazing to me. You could tell they put a lot of psychoacoustic theory into practice. It's not a perfect system and I don't think they ever thought it would be. Sure, it's far from accurate, but it does give you stereo separation and some sense of bass. So thinking back, maybe the 90s weren't so bad after all. Anyway, that's it. If you liked the video, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell to be notified when I upload new videos. You can find more exclusive videos from me at avmasterclass.com. And if you're into mechanical keyboards, I just started a new channel where I measure the acoustics of mechanical keyboards. It's appropriately named Keyboard Acoustics. I'll link to those down below. That's it. Take care. Bye-bye.